Congratulations, you won! Wow. For playing, you'll receive a trip to our arcade media gallery, where you'll enjoy many fantastic arcade sites. And so, until next time, it's goodbye. Welcome to the Arcade Trivia Game Show! Today's contestants will be competing for over 3 billion pixels in prizes! So without further ado, on to the first question! The name that we wanted to use was Master Blaster, and we discovered at the time that there was a pinball simulation program called Billy Budge's Raster Blaster available for the Apple computer, so decided to change the name to avoid confusion. Uh, we pondered and toiled for a couple of weeks to come up with a better name for the game, and in frustration ended up just simply shortening it to Blaster. Three. One is on display at my dad's house in Palo Alto, the other game, well, actually the second game, was converted into a Devastator game, which is a very limited edition prototype. And there have been unconfirmed sightings of the third game. Its actual whereabouts are unknown at this time. Dermold unfortunately had its tendency to shrink and was only used in two games, Blaster and Bubbles. Now normally this exhibited itself in a shrinkage that made the coin door hard to open. But actually in one game, it was reported that the shrinkage increased the internal pressure of the cabinet so much that the monitor was ejected across the arcade and impaled a Donkey Kong Jr. machine. Fortunately, there were no other injuries. Well, the day after we cashed the check, Atari supernova and Jack Tramiel fired 90% of the workforce in the great video game crash. Unfortunately, not a single remaining Atari employee knew of the existence of the Blaster Project, and Blaster forever vanished into the rubble of the great video game debacle. Doing a first-person flying game in 1983 without any scaling or rotating computer hardware is quite a challenge, uh, particularly it meant that each pixel of each image had to be hand-drawn in each size and in each rotation that it was displayed in the game. Uh, this caused thousands of hours of artist time to be necessary to generate all of the artwork that you see in the game. After initial testing, the ability to buy in and continue your game uh, when it was over by inserting additional money was removed from the game. At the same time, the game was shortened from 30 stages to 20 stages to make it possible to complete it on one coin. Um, at this time, there was a stage called Outer Space, which among other things had this gargantuanly large uh, Starship Enterprise that would just fly over your head uh, for about three miles. Uh, and that whole stage was removed uh, at this time. Even though it may take two minutes for your 266 megahertz Pentium 2 to boot up, Blaster was programmed, believe it or not, with a one megahertz chip. And man, did it hurt. That'd be Budweiser. And uh, the way that came about was uh, Scott and I came up with an idea for a, uh, a bar game and we were, uh, we were intrigued by the idea of sliding beers and empty mugs down a, a bar and what kind of action you could get with a bartender and some uh, angry customers or some happy customers. And we did some initial design work on that and we went to Bally Midway and there was a fellow at Bally Midway who uh, was very good at getting licenses. I think his name was Tom Neiman. And he went out and uh, talked to Budweiser in St. Louis, got them excited, and we all went down and uh, talked to them some more, and Budweiser was on board. Bally Midway at the time had really good cabinet people, so we suggested a cabinet that looked like a bar, 
Um, they put a brass rail at the bottom of the, of the uh, cabinet where you could rest your foot while you're sitting on a stool playing the game. They put uh, metal uh, cup holders on the control panel where you could rest your drink, uh, preferably a Budweiser. And the Budweiser tappers looked like, um, or the tappers to pour beer actually looked like Budweiser tappers. Um, for the root beer version, they changed the, ga the cabinet just slightly where they put some extra stickers on the cabinet to say root beer and that they changed the Budweiser logos to root beer logos. Well, uh, we tested uh, Tapper first in the snuggery, and that was a new kind of testing for us. We'd previously only tested in arcades, and so I think Scott and I really enjoyed an opportunity to go uh, test this in the evenings at the snuggery, and it was exciting for us to watch uh, players uh, who were having a good time in the bar kind of wander over and, uh, and get excited about a beer drinking game, a Budweiser game, and uh, we, uh, we enjoyed watching them and we, got, we learned a lot from those initial tests. We knew we had a, a winner when we watched uh, people play. I've always had sort of an eclectic taste in music. In college I got into a lot of alternative stuff. Um, I was a big fan of Devo and Talking Heads, uh, the Ramones. Um, I used to listen to that a lot uh, in my office while I was designing the characters. Um, I had a lot of fun putting safety pins through their heads and mohawks on, their, on, their, uh, on the characters. And uh, most of the uh, other uh, designers on the project didn't really care for that kind of stuff, so I tried to keep it to myself as much as possible. But it was um, kind of fun to bring the, the, the music scene of the time and put it into the video game. It kind of dates the whole piece. Well, we worked on uh, several together. The first one was Domino Man. I had a minor role in that, but I think Rich and Elaine Ditton were really the uh, drivers uh, on that one. And then uh, after that, I worked on a game called Wacko with Scott. We uh, were matching aliens and mismatching aliens, and it was really a lot of fun. You get some interesting combinations. I still look back, and I like that game very, very much. And then we came up with an interesting idea of a two-player a competitive game, which was one of the first. There were a few that preceded it, but you were a logger and you were playing against another logger trying to knock trees on each other. And uh, we had a log rolling uh, round in there, and we really had a lot of fun with that one. It was almost in the same vein as Tapper, but uh, a, a little bit different play mechanics. So uh, we, we uh, worked on some interesting stuff. Back in those days, uh, uh, creators of games were really not allowed to put their names or, or credits into the game, so we kind of snuck it in as an Easter egg. We really weren't supposed to, but we did anyways. Um, during the attract scene, um, while the word tapper is filling up with liquid, uh, either beer or root beer, um, if you're holding all the controls down and press the player one start and player two start at the same time, our credits will come up on the screen. We're designing all the characters for the game. Um, we had a lot of fun animations, and after they would drink the beers, we, they, you know, some of them would burp. We thought, wouldn't that be a kick to have a burp sound in the game? So we contacted Texas Instruments to see if they had any kind of speech chips that we could do to use for the game. Um, they had a speech specialist at the time who brought us over to their office, supplied us with a six-pack of beer. We all sat around a microphone drinking beer and belching into it. And uh, we ended up with a pretty neat chip full of our belches. Um, we put it in the game, and uh, uh, after almost every beer, they would belch. And it, it was very, very funny, but it got pretty obnoxious. And we all decided that Budweiser probably wouldn't be too thrilled with the idea, so we scrapped it. Well, originally, um, it was going to be the James Bond theme, because uh, um, Bill Adams, who was running the software group at the time, and I were both huge James Bond fans. And uh, we had gone to Japan, and I'd picked up a tape of James Bond's greatest hits. And the very first time we brought the game up, uh, I mean, it was really, the, the entire game was, was very, very James Bond inspired. But the game played with the James Bond theme for many months until we couldn't get the rights, at which point uh, one of the marketing guys suggested Peter Gunn, which was something we weren't terribly familiar with. But, uh, you know, it did the trick. The car was a, um, a 1983 Z28, which I had just gotten, and uh, I'm a huge car nut, so I actually wanted to do lots of different cars, and one of the problems was that um, we really had tremendous limitations. I mean, you know, 32 by 32 pixel picture blocks, two of them stacked to draw the car. Uh, couldn't get a lot of, you really couldn't get a lot of anything that looked like any real car. Originally, I wanted it to be 
something even flashier and we couldn't get it in so um, the red my car was red the red didn't look great either um, so we ended up with a white car that showed up really well had some red and blue stripes on it um, you have to remember that it was a time when the company was doing tremendously well with Japanese game licenses um, you know we we're making 1200 Pac-Man a day um, and that's not an exaggeration you know so um, it was a time when you know an internal development group made up of guys that just really wanted to make games we were just kind of you know they, they put us in a warehouse off-site for kind of forgot about us and um, you know basically there was the the pressure was uh, we wanted to make really cool games but they had plenty of product to put on an assembly line it's a little different than today where we actually you know we need when when a game designer has a product in development that product is, is expected to make it to market so um, the pressure was a little different when we start doing a game we typically throw in the kitchen sink uh, at before reality intrudes and um, so this game had everything that you've ever seen in a spy movie and um, um, the transformation to the boat um, and then followed by was supposed to be followed by a transformation to a flying device uh, something like the helicopter so you could go head to head with the enemy helicopter that that is is such a bastard in the game. Uh, the inspiration for Splat had a lot to do with uh, uh, John Belushi's big scene in Animal House. Uh, it was it was a good time. It was a lot of fun, and uh, uh, I thought just a food fight would make a really good game. Uh, and then uh, you know it, it might just be me, but uh, I, I think. I don't know. This is potentially funny to me. I, I don't know. <laughs> the unique feature is that uh, your character can take two hits instead of one before he dies. Now, uh, really the best way to show the significance of this uh, strategy is to demonstrate it. Now, uh, suppose this were a splat character and uh, you're throwing food, but now he takes, he takes a hit like that. Now if he takes a hit then that means that his head comes off. But he can go around and try to find his head but and he's still in the game. However, if he takes another hit then you're still dead. Joust came out with a vertical monitor because it was, it was during a time period when uh, dedicated videos were having a great deal of difficulty. So Joust 2 is supposed to be a, uh, a kit to retrofit various games out in the field. At that time, most of the games in the field were vertical monitors like Pac-Man, Ms. Pac-Man, uh, you know, etc. Uh, it also seemed like uh, the vertical screen would uh, give the player uh, more height so that they could fly and open up some new uh, play possibilities. And uh, for lack of any other reason, it seemed like a good idea at the time. The fun of the Pegasus is that you have to, uh, you have to choose uh, at what times to strategically become uh, an ostrich and a pegasus. The advantage is that an ostrich uh, moves faster in the air but isn't as strong on the ground. Uh, pegasus being a much uh, uh, more stout beast is when you're on the ground uh, if there's a tie you're both on the same level uh, it wins. Um, but if you're fighting in the air, it's sinking like a rock, so you're almost always higher than the Pegasus. So uh, you need to decide which character you want to use and when. It's an easy question. My favorite artist is uh, M.C. Escher. And um, Escher is famous for doing the drawings and sketches of uh, three-dimensional objects forming out of uh, two-dimensional space. And so that's why you see a lot of the uh, uh, buzzards falling out of the background and things of that nature. And uh, just as a plus for me is we both share the same birthday. <laughs>